This is Nightly Business Report with Sue Herrera and Bill Griffin. Trade truce. The S&P 500 closes at a record after the U.S. and China ratchet back trade tensions and resume talks. So what's next? Semis surge. Chip stocks benefit from the easing of trade tensions and rally strongly. So where does the group go from here? And refi time? Mortgage rates are plunging and many Americans are taking the plunge to refinance. Why now might be a good opportunity. All those stories and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Monday, July 1st. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. It was a record close on Wall Street following what you could call a trade truce. Over the weekend at the G20 summit in Japan, the U.S. and China agreed to hold off on levying more tariffs in an effort to get trade talks going again. President Trump also said the U.S. would relax restrictions on American companies selling products to Chinese telecom giant Huawei. As a result, stocks got an initial lift, and while the gains were more than halved, it was still a record day. The Dow rose 117 points to 26,717. The Nasdaq, helped by the chip stocks, we'll have more on them in a moment, rose about 85, and the S&P 500 climbed 22 to a record, its sixth so far this year. We have two reports on trade, starting with Kayla Tausche in Washington. After a six-week standoff, President Trump and President Xi brokered a ceasefire in 80 minutes. Trump agreed to relax a ban on Huawei in exchange for China's buying more farm goods, and there will be no new tariffs. The truce has no deadline, which means President Trump can end it whenever talks fall through, or keep it going as long as it's politically useful, telling reporters he's in no rush. So we're making a deal with China, or we're attempting. And if we don't, we'll go back into, you know, we have a tremendous ripe field of tremendous money that would be coming into our country. I'm not rushed, and I told him that I want to get the deal right. Multinational companies are relieved tensions have eased, but have more questions than answers about what comes next. What's the timeline for these negotiations? How serious are both sides at come to a resolution? What happens if they can't reach an agreement on these issues? Because that, 400, that $300 billion list of tariffs is still looming out there. It's just put on hold for the moment. And the issues that sank talks in May are still outstanding, namely China's ability to legally enforce the deal. China's hardliners don't seem any easier to sway now, and hawks in Washington are not happy the White House is bargaining with a company seen as a national security risk. At least three Republicans slamming the decision, and one Florida Senator, Marco Rubio, suggesting he'll introduce a bill to reverse it. With so many competing forces, future sales for Huawei vendors are still in question. Is this going to be part of an end game trade deal or is this something that um, he's going to reserve as a national security issue? In Osaka, the president wouldn't commit. Huawei is very much in play in terms of our country and in terms of intelligence and the intelligence community. We're not making it a big subject. We're going to save that for later. When later is, isn't clear. Asked when a new round of talks could take place, the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative and the Treasury Department said they had no scheduling announcements. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Kayla Tausche in Washington. And now to China with a look at how the trade truce is playing out there. Eunice Yoon is in Beijing. The Chinese are generally relieved with the outcome, but cautious. In official statements and media reports, they are pleased with the delay of new tariffs, that there is no deadline for negotiations, and they're especially happy that hometown tech champ Huawei gets a reprieve. In addition, the Chinese side has been left with an impression that President Trump has agreed to Beijing's preconditions for a trade deal, what are described here as its three red lines, lifting all the imposed tariffs, more realistic purchases of U.S. goods, and balanced text in the final deal. That's because President Trump, according to the foreign ministry, agreed to move forward on the basis of, quote, equality and mutual respect. Despite the fresh direction, there's still apprehension that a trade agreement will get done. Sources close to the trade talks on the Chinese side have noticed that President Trump is already under pressure from Congress and the national security community to maintain his original tough position on Huawei. 
One other interesting development here, the Chinese press are not reporting China's agreement to buy more American farm products or that the U.S. has not reduced the current tariffs. That shows how sensitive the leadership is to appearing weak or that it's giving in to U.S. pressure. An indication of just how challenging the domestic political environment here is for Beijing to make even further serious compromises. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Eunice Yoon in Beijing. Let's turn now to Mohamed Alarian. He is, of course, the chief economic advisor at Allianz. Mohamed, always great to see you. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you, Bill. What, in your view, is the message of the U.S. stock market right now when you bear in mind that Treasuries, long-term Treasury yields are close to two-year lows, and now, following the Osaka summit, we still have tariffs, 25 percent tariffs, for the foreseeable future. Why are we at an all-time high right now? For three reasons. One is the truce, or I like calling it the ceasefire. Things won't get any worse. Second, the Huawei news was a surprise to the market. So that suggested an easing of tension that goes beyond the headline of the ceasefire. And thirdly, it keeps the Fed in play, meaning that because the uncertainty hasn't been fundamentally lifted, the Fed is likely to cut in July. So the markets like the ceasefire because it calms things down without taking away the Fed weight cut. Are you surprised, though, at the lack of volatility that we've had just recently anyway, Mohammed? I mean, it, I'd say about three months ago, every time we got a trade headline, we were either up 100 points or down 100 points. And we've seen a lot less of that. We have, because there's been a major pivot on the part of central banks. Um, the four major central banks have all indicated that they're going to stimulate more. And the markets have been conditioned to respect liquidity from central banks. So the more the central banks are willing to decouple the markets from the underlying fundamentals, the more the market does that for them. So it doesn't really surprise me. What's, what, and what also doesn't surprise me is the economists aren't that excited about what happened over the weekend. Mm -hmm. They tell you the basic uncertainty isn't gone. Companies are not going to invest based on a truce. They want a peace deal, and that hasn't come yet. What can you point to in our economy that warrants a cut by the Federal Reserve in July? When you bear in mind that just last week, Jerome Powell said that the Fed's monetary policy will not be based on what he called short-term political interests. What, what is it that's going to prompt a cut, do you think, next month or this month? If you look at the U.S. on a standalone, it's actually very hard to find reasoning. Um, if you look at the U.S. in the context of a weak global economy, then this notion of an insurance cut um, comes up, Bill. But let me just warn, warn um, people watching. The market has gone way beyond an insurance cut. The market is pricing in four cuts in the next 12 months. That's not insurance. That is a signal that there's something really wrong with the economy. And do you see that? Do you see inherent risks in the economy that might warrant what the market is expecting? I don't think that the, the economy itself will warrant what the market is expecting, unless you assume there's going to be a major policy mistake or a major market accident. The, the economy is still in a good place. Yes, it's not as strong as it was a year ago, but it is still significantly moving forward and distancing itself from the rest of the world. You're one who likes to take the global picture uh, of, of things and try and make sense of it uh, as a whole. So we've got the, the geopolitical concerns in the Middle East that are pushing oil prices higher. We've got those yields uh, here in the United States are at near two-year lows. We've got the Brexit mess that's going on in Europe right now, uh, the, the trade tensions between the U.S. and, and China. Where are we globally right now? Are we seeing a, a meaningful slowdown economically, do you think? Yes, we are, and Europe in particular. I mean, something that has flown below the radar screen today is what happened in Germany. German 10-year yields ended at minus 36 basis points, almost mi minus half a percent. Why? Because the manufacturing data that came out overnight, they were horrible, Bill, absolutely horrible. And I worry about Europe. I worry about stall speed economies in Europe. And that's what's keeping our yields down. I'm all with your introduction. Go and refinance, because you're really getting a gift from Europe at this point in terms of downward pressure on our own yields. Indeed. 
Mohamed Alarian with Allianz. Again, thanks for joining us tonight, Mohamed. Thank you. As we mentioned, the big winner of the day, chip stocks. The sector rallied on the Huawei news. The semiconductor index rising more than 2% on the day. Josh Lipton has more. Chip investors had been expecting good news at the G20 summit, and they got it. President Trump and Chinese President Xi Jinping agreed over the weekend to proceed with negotiations, and both sides said they didn't plan to levy new tariffs against each other's products right now. We had a great meeting, and we will be continuing to negotiate. That's welcome news for chip companies because China is a key market for them, as well as an important link in their supply chains. The SMH, an ETF that tracks the chips, rose in today's trade, and that's after surging higher in June, its best month since September 2010. President Trump also suggested that he would lift the ban on U.S. companies selling equipment to Chinese tech giant Huawei in cases that don't involve U.S. national security. Analysts say that could benefit chip companies that count Huawei as an important customer. Yeah, so from a high level, we think this benefits semi-cap equipment. Essentially, this equipment makes chips for all companies. And so we don't think that'll be deemed as a national security risk. That would be applied materials, LAM research, and ASML. Secondly, we also think this benefits Micron, since Huawei's been a 13% customer. And so now they can ship as many chips as they would like to them. We think that'll improve sales going forward. But Steve says the implication of the Huawei announcement was unclear for other chip companies like NVIDIA and AMD. While he thinks those companies ultimately trade higher, he says their products do represent potential national security risks. As a sector, where do the semis head from here? Analysts note that the second half of the year is a typically strong one for chips, but they point out that if chip stocks are going to keep posting gains, investors need to see continued signs of trade progress. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Josh Lipton at San Francisco. And there was also this news out of the semiconductor sector. Chip equipment maker Applied Materials is buying Kokusai Electric from private equity firm KKR for a little over $2 billion. The Japanese firm makes wireless equipment. That sends shares of AMAT higher by nearly 2% today. And while the chip sector is rallying on the temporary truce, intellectual property is still a key sticking point between the U.S. and China. And it's not just the chip companies that are vulnerable. Joining us to discuss that and who stands to win or lose is Timothy Lesko, principal at Granite Investment Advisors. Good to see you again, Tim. Welcome back. No, oh, thanks for having me. You make the case that we need to cast a, a broader net, if you will, or a wider net that all companies that have intellectual property are at risk? Yeah, basically, you know, Chinese manufacturers have been copying American goods, whether they be technology goods, whether they be consumer goods, um, for decades. And one of the things that we failed to put into place would be some sort of recourse, that when our goods are either copied or intellectual property stolen, there's no court system for us to really go to in China to get a remedy. And that's really what these negotiations are looking for. And we really haven't seen any sign of that yet. But the Chinese have made clear, Tim, that they are not going to change their laws uh, to change how they go after intellectual property. And in, in that case, are we realistically going to get a change in how our relationship is with the Chinese as it rela relates to IP theft? I think we will. I think that they see us as a very valuable market. We see them as a, as a long-term trading partner. And so I think the hope is, is that there, there becomes some remedy, whether it's a Chinese law that has changed or whether they're willing to live by World Trade Organization rules or general agreements on tariffs and trade, that we come to a point where we have a, perhaps a neutral, mutual ground to, to air these grievances in the future. What companies would be on your watch list that are perhaps most vulnerable between the situation between the U.S. and China as it stands now? Well, I think we're on the cusp of the great move towards automation. And everything that's going to be automated is going to rely on fifth generation cellular technologies, as well as a lot of other technologies that are either developed here and made in China, or in some cases developed in China. So companies like you know, Google's Waymo division, Apple, if they're developing a car, um, you have to think that everybody wants to get involved in the infrastructure associated with that automation. And if there are a lot of tariff battles and intellectual property battles, some of that technology will be slower and slower to bring to market. 
So it really ca casts a pretty wide shadow over the entire industry. On that note, Timothy Lesko with Granite Investment Advisors. Thanks, Tim. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. And coming up, a peek behind the curtain of big money donors. Charles Koch is one of the most powerful names in conservative politics, and we get an inside look at his exclusive retreat for business leaders, donors, and politicians coming up next. OPEC has agreed to extend production cuts by nine months. The deal must now be approved by non-OPEC allies tomorrow. Domestic crude crossed $60 a barrel earlier in the day, but closed just below that mark. Brian Sullivan has more from Vienna. It was a long day here at OPEC headquarters in Vienna, Austria, but in the end, it did end with two pieces of big news. Number one, the group has agreed to extend production cuts made last year of 1.2 million barrels of oil per day by nine months. That's longer than expected and takes the group into 2020. They are trying to counter the weight of growing U.S. shale output as OPEC has lost a little bit of its market power. But the second piece of news is designed to counter that. The group has signed a long-term deal of cooperation with Russia. Russia is not a member of OPEC, but has been criticized lately for maybe placing too big of a role of itself on a group to which it does not belong. But the group finally here, OPEC, agreeing that they would agree to cooperate with a Russia-led coalition, which gives OPEC about 11 million barrels more day of oil of market power. That is the outcome of today's meeting, but that wasn't all the drama. First off, around the criticism that OPEC had become perhaps too close to Russia. In fact, the Saudi oil minister in the media scrum had to acknowledge the fact that every OPEC member still matters. We are very respectful of every member countries. The fact of the matter is Saudi Arabia and Russia are the largest producers, and we are delivering the largest uh, cuts. And for us to agree first and then to discuss our agreement with our colleagues from other countries, I think only helps reach the, the unanimous consensus that we're seeking. Of course, the other overarching piece of news here hanging over was Iran upset with OPEC of what it perceived as lack of support around U.S. oil sanctions. We had a chance to catch up with the Iranian oil minister as well and asked him what would it take to get Iran back to the table with the United States. If the United States and the administration wants to change that environment between two countries, firstly, should leave the all sanction put against Iranian oil and other areas. Then they will, they will see significant, significant change in the environment, and then we can do many things. A lot there and a lot of background noise as well. Effectively, what he said is, we would need to stop our blockade of Iranian oil exports to have any hope of Iran coming back to the table. Either way, OPEC got Iran to the table. They signed that long-term deal. Tomorrow, it will be day two of the meeting where Russia makes its presence felt literally and figuratively could be another hot one inside and outside here in Vienna. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Brian Sullivan, Vienna, Austria. More problems for Boeing, and that's where we begin tonight's market focus with the Department of Justice reportedly subpoenaing records at Boeing's 787 Dreamliner production plant in South Carolina. The Seattle Times says the prosecutors are looking into Boeing's records due to allegations of subpar work at that assembly plant. The stock fell more than 2 percent today to 356.46. Elsewhere, railroad company Genesee in Wyoming was sold to Canada's Brookfield Infrastructure and Singapore's Sovereign Wealth Fund for nearly $6.5 billion in cash. That deal makes the railroad operator a private company at a time when the industry looks to switch to running fewer and longer trains with tighter schedules. The uh, shares rose nearly 9% today on that news at 108.85. Wynn's shares rose after the Macau Gaming Authority, Gambling Authority, I should say, said gaming revenue came in better than expected last month, rising nearly 6 percent. This comes as the Chinese economy was weakened from the trade war tariffs. Wynn's shares rose almost 6 percent to 131.25. 
Cody will be taking a $3 billion write-down as the cosmetics company looks to restructure after acquiring brands from Procter & Gamble nearly three years ago. The four-year plan hopes to increase revenue while also keeping up with rivals in the beauty cosmetics industry. Cody's shares fell more than 13 percent to 11.59. South Bend, Indiana Mayor Pete Buttigieg's campaign says the presidential hopeful has raised nearly $25 million in the last three months from almost 300,000 donors. That is likely to be among the highest amounts raised by any of the Democratic candidates in the second quarter. And Home Depot co-founder Bernie Marcus tells the Atlanta Journal-Constitution that he plans to give up to 90 percent of his fortune to charity when he dies. It's estimated his net worth is between roughly four and a half and six billion dollars. He is also a big political donor, having been a top donor to President Trump's run in 2016. And he tells the paper he will contribute to his reelection bid. Boy, the Koch name is among the most influential when it comes to political fundraising. And today, one of the Koch brothers brought together big money donors to discuss where to put their money in our highly politicized world. Ilan Mui got a rare access to this summit in Colorado Springs. Out in Colorado and the foothills of the Cheyenne Mountains, hundreds of wealthy donors and business leaders are gathered for a three-day retreat led by billionaire Charles Koch. It's an exclusive event, and cameras aren't typically allowed, and who attends is kept strictly private. But we got some rare access to understand the evolution of one of the most powerful forces in conservative politics. Here's the video donors saw at the start of the summit. We're in the midst of a shift that could be even more transformative than the invention of the printing press or the Industrial Revolution. It means the future is one of unlimited possibilities but it's also disrupting key institutions of our society. Koch's political and philanthropic network has had to change its strategy ever since President Trump was elected. They didn't support him back in 2016, and they're sitting out in this race as well. Instead, Charles Koch told donors that he's willing to work across the political spectrum to advance specific causes, free trade, free speech, immigration, and the economy. Just imagine what the country would be like if we had many, many more people with this philosophy, if we had millions more who were dedicated to uniting with anybody to do right. That's been my lifetime goal. It's the philosophy that helped the network build a coalition of Republicans, Democrats, and even celebrities to pass criminal justice reform last year. And now, it's bringing in unlikely new partners, like former NFL MVP Sean Alexander. He learned about the Koch network through friends, and they helped put him in touch with a nonprofit called Cafe Momentum that employs teenagers who have been in jail. We all are in agreement that if we have the same values, same vision, and that we can complement each other, then we can actually get together and do something special. And one body with many parts, you know? And so sometimes if you're good at being a knee and I'm the calf, it really makes us run fast if we work together. Alexander wants to bring Cafe Momentum to every NFL city in the country. It's an approach the network calls bottom-up social entrepreneurship. And they say that's the path toward healing the nation's divisions. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Milan Mui in Colorado Springs. Coming up with mortgage rates falling, is now the right time to refinance? Finally tonight, homeowners take note. Now could be a great opportunity to refinance your mortgage. Diana Olick has some surprising new numbers. 
mortgage rates have been on a roller coaster for the last year, but now they're sitting at the bottom of the track, and that's a big opportunity for borrowers. The average rate on the 30-year fixed hit a three-year low of 3.73% last week, according to Freddie Mac. It was right around 5% less than a year ago. At today's rate, just over 8 million borrowers can refinance and lower their interest rates by at least 75 basis points. That's the largest group since 2016, according to Black Knight. It's also a jump of more than 6 million eligible borrowers since last November. How much can the average borrower save? About $266 per month. Most borrowers tend to refinance after several years, but those who took out their mortgages last year could benefit most, about one and a half million of them. No surprise, mortgage applications to refinance were up a striking 92 percent annually last week, according to the Mortgage Bankers Association. While refinancing can lower monthly payments, it's also an opportunity to take cash out of your home, but very few people are doing that. Home equity levels are very high right now, but borrowers in the first part of this year took out just $54 billion collectively. That was the lowest amount in four years and less than 1 percent of what was available. Today's borrowers just seem more conservative, which which makes sense given what happened the last time homeowners started using their homes like ATMs. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Diana Olick in Washington. And before we go, let's take a look at what was a winning day on Wall Street and in some cases a record day. The Dow rose 117 points to 26,717. The Nasdaq rose about 85 and the S&P 500 climbed 22 to a record. Welcome back, by the way. Thank you we very missed you much. Last week. Remember the days when summertime would arrive and the market would slow down? Would slow down. No, they're doesn't, gone. Doesn't happen anymore. No, which is why sure. you have to join us every night. Exactly. That does it for us tonight on NBR. I'm Sue Herrera. Thanks for joining us. I'm Bill Griffith. Have a great evening. See you tomorrow.